Why are opioids awesome? Well, for the patient point of view, opioids are pretty awesome because you get a rapid cessation of pain. You get rapid relief from suffering. And you can get relief even from anxiety and depression upon a single dose of this medication. It sounds a bit like a miracle drug, and for many people, it is if you have a bone sticking out of your leg or you have just gotten out of a massive surgery, this medication can be really helpful. And in fact, this is one of the reasons it was the mainstay of treatment for pain for over 100 years. From the prescriber point of view, it's pretty awesome too on its surface. And the, the reason being is it's quick patient satisfaction. There are very few things we can do as physicians where a patient is screaming in pain, I give a medication, and all of a sudden I have a patient who's okay. They're calm, they're relaxed. Many times they just go to sleep, which they prefer if they're in horrible pain. This is great in the outpatient setting where a patient comes in and says, I have suffering and I have pain and I need help, and you have 15 minutes to see a patient, you can write a prescription, you can have a conversation with them, and you can send them home. And they, early in its course, have a pretty good outcome. They feel comfortable, their function does improve in early treatment with opioids. And from a prescriber perspective, it's great because you now have a satisfied patient who you've, in theory, improved their function as well as decreased their pain. What could go wrong with this, right? Well, how do opioids achieve this miracle? Well, they do it through the body's natural processes and augmenting that, and they do it if somebody is in pain by binding to the mu opioid receptor, mimicking the body's own opioids called endorphins. When that happens, it decreases the amount of pain that the patient feels. If you're not in pain, it does something totally different. What it does is it goes to two different parts of the brain called the nucleus accumbens and the ventral tegmental area. When that happens, you get this discordant release of dopamine, this increase in dopamine in the reward system that's far beyond what it should be normally. And when that happens, you get this overwhelming feeling of calm and over-rewarding. When that happens, that's not natural. And this is where things get a little tricky. If people were experiencing anxiety or a high level of stress, all of a sudden, they feel elated. That starts to have a patient want to feel that way, appropriately. We would all like to feel elated. But the first few times what it may work, it stops working over time and that dopamine goes down and down and down. And we've talked about this on other lectures in this, in this website and really, we all know that this is unnatural for someone to have anxiety and suffering and then immediately feel elated. That's not an okay pathway. This effect by itself actually increases the rewarding effect over and over again. And that reinforcing effect makes people need to take more to get that same feeling. And as they take more, their body becomes more and more dependent on the drug. As they become more dependent on the drug, it becomes scarier and scarier to stop taking it. And the body reacts by decreasing the response so that the dopamine level doesn't really create elation anymore. It just barely creates a feeling of normalcy, barely. And this is really what underlays the, the whole fundamental aspect of addiction. So why do opioids suck? We talked about why they were awesome, now, why are they bad? Well, they have an addiction liability, which means that if you give it to someone consistently, there's a portion of the population that will become addicted to the opioid. Now, this has been all over the place, and it's ranged from 1% in a letter to the editor of the New England Journal of Medicine, all the way up to greater than 50% in some uh, cohort studies that have been done. It probably lives somewhere in the high teens and mid-20s, and as a comparator, alcohol has about a 17% addiction liability, which means that if somebody uses alcohol on a consistent basis, they will start to develop the behaviors associated with addiction. And opioids are the same way. If somebody is taking uh, these medications and they don't have significant pain, or if they have chronic pain, that this may be pushing on the dopamine differently as well, and they take it on a regular basis, what we find is that probably somewhere between 17 and 25% of people will develop all of those behaviors associated with addiction. And 
this doesn't even really start to get into the biggest risk of opioids, which we've seen a lot of in the United States, overdose. In 2016, over 35,000 people died of opioid overdose, with more than 60,000 people dying of overdose in general. It's, this is not getting better in 2017, and quite honestly, things are continuing to go up, where after 2017, we're expecting over 50,000 people that will die from an opioid overdose, and greater than 75 to 80,000 people will die from overdose in general. I mean, this is, this is a little crazy, especially since the vast majority of overdoses happen from prescription opioids, not heroin. However, now we're doing all the hard work of the CDC guidelines and the VA DOD guidelines, and by doing so, we're locking down the prescriptions of opioids. But maybe not in a way that's really going to decrease the chances of trouble for patients. Because if you just stop opioids and you don't give a patient an option for treatment or you do it slowly so that they don't feel overt withdrawal, then people are going to be lured to things like heroin. So I know most of you, when I use that term lured, you're thinking, well, what does he mean by lured? This is something that's a choice, right? You can just decide if you wanna go use heroin. It's not that easy. And um, please don't oversimplify it to that level because it actually neurobiologically is a wrong assessment. And what we find is that the reality of this risk of craving that a patient has when they don't have the drug, the risk of overdose, the fear that goes along with this from a person who is physically dependent and addicted to opioids overrides all of that logical thought. And so when they're presented with a, a time when they can't pick up their prescription or the doctor stops writing it and they are gonna go into withdrawal and they don't know where to go and they're scared to death and they go to someone to help get these medications yet it's $20 a pill, what do they do? If they can't afford $20 a pill, what they can do is they'll take whatever they can get. And many times when they go to that level, it's, it's heroin. And heroin at first is not something that people have to inject. And so all they have to do with something that's 85% pure is snort it. And they can still get that feeling of normalcy. And in fact, most of them won't even get high from it if they've been addicted to prescription drugs for an extended period of time. It'll just make them feel normal, but it wears off really fast. And so they'll have to use more and more to the point where snorting it won't do it. And then their only course of action is a $10 bag of heroin that they have to inject just so that they don't go into profound withdrawal. So as if injecting heroin by itself wasn't risky enough, we've now had the introduction of these other versions of opioids called synthetics. What are synthetics? Well, synthetics are medications like Fentanyl, which is really meant for human utilization, but it's a very powerful drug that's 100 times more powerful than morphine. And now we're even seeing things that were built for animal tranquilizers, like elephants. And these are sufentanil and carfentanil. These are primarily made overseas or south of the border and then shipped into the United States. They get mixed into the heroin and patients unwittingly or people will take this not knowing that it has a lethal dose of one of these synthetics in it and overdose. And one of the other problems with this is that these are medications that don't even really respond to naloxone, the medication we use to reverse that overdose. They are thousands of times more powerful than morphine. And I think if you think about it, you'll realize most dealers are not chemists. You know, they don't have a lab where they're sitting down and measuring exactly what they go, or you're putting into this and exactly what concentration down to the microgram level, because it is microgram levels. An amount the size of a grain of sand of carfentanil will kill you. And so if they happen to accidentally drop an extra grain of sand in a packet of heroin, that person will die. And we're seeing this along the eastern seaboard and it's now spreading into middle America. And by the time you're watching this in uh, late 2017 or early 2018, who knows where it's gonna be at that point? Because we are now behind the eight ball when it comes to you know, these, these synthetics because they are easier to ship into the United States because you can take something the size of a packet of sugar 
and ship that in, and that will give you 100 to 1,000 hits for someone on the street. As compared to coming in with a brick of heroin, you can now put this little bitty packet in your pocket. So this is why they're doing it. And the people that are suffering from this are those that have the addiction to the opioids. One of the questions I get often is, well, is this person addicted or are they just having poorly treated pain? Because they're seeking pain relief. So why can't it just be that if we fix the pain that they don't have addiction and it just so happens that they use the opioid to treat the pain? Well, you know, I would say that this is really a difference without a distinction. Because if the pain relief seeking behaviors are focused solely on obtaining an opioid, then we should be treating these patients like they have an opioid use disorder. Because those behaviors are very well delineated within the DSM-5. I mean, it's not like you know, patients are breaking into a yoga studio or a physical therapist, you know, to try to get extra treatments. They're specifically going after opioids. And those opioids have that draw and that change in the mentation that creates this behavior of what we call drug-seeking behavior. Some people will justify it internally by being pain relief-seeking. But of the thousands of patients that I've seen, I've literally only had one that I would call pseudo-addiction. And his pain behaviors were off the chart in the minute that we treated his pain adequately without giving him opioids, his behavior completely shifted. But one out of thousands is not a policy that we should be looking at. And based on the CDC and the VA DOD guidelines, you know, we probably shouldn't be using opioids to treat pain in these patients at all, even if they say it helps. And we'll hear that. We'll hear them say, if you just increase the dose, I'll be fine. If you just, just a little higher. And they will almost get into a state of begging because the draw and the craving and the fear of not having these drugs in the system overrides that logical thought process in the frontal lobe. So in short, if we're talking about opioids and their liability as an addictive substance, they have to be up there either at the level of alcohol or higher as far as risk. If they're used for acute pain or end of life pain, they're great, they're safe, they're appropriate. But for utilization in patients with chronic pain or something that we can't really identify, there is only a significant amount of risk the longer you use them or the higher the doses that you use. So patients who have pain behaviors that look like those of a patient who have an opioid use disorder should just be treated like they have an opioid use disorder and get appropriate behavioral therapies, appropriate medication-assisted treatment, appropriate wraparound case management. All of these things should happen because what they really need is someone to listen to them, recognize that they are suffering, and treat the right disease, not the wrong one.